All right, so let's go to Matthew chapter 22. Open your Bibles there, and we'll look at the parable of the wedding banquet. All right, so just like we have been doing, you'll have... We'll look, at the, we'll look at it contextually, historically, if, that, if there's any information pertinent to our interpretation. We'll come up with the main idea, and then we'll go ahead and look at the parable and interpret it based on those things. All right, so Matthew 22. All right, what is our context here? So Matthew 22, uh, verses 1 through 14, it says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, and he says, the kingdom of heaven. So here we go again. This would be a kingdom parable. Only that, that doesn't mean that every kingdom parable has the same context. Uh, there was a question about that before. <coughs> Some of the kingdom parables, for example, this when he says the kingdom of heaven is like, would have a bit different context. What would the context of this one be? Why did he give a kingdom parable? Well, it is the same context, really, as the, mer- the, uh, the last ones we looked at. Okay, so we looked at the parable of the two sons and the parable of the vineyard. And we talked about that, and we said that the context of these parables was in, in regards to them uh, having questioning his authority. Remember we talked about that? That's kind of a review. So we said that they said, with what authority do these things? So this was the triumphal entry. Christ came into Jerusalem. One of the first things that he did was overturn the money changers' tables. And uh, then he said, then later on, the, uh, I think it was the next day. Um, yeah, so it says, verse 18, Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered, and when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, the leaves only, and so forth. And then uh, it says in verse 23, and verses chapter 21. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? All right. Then he asked them a question regarding John the Baptist. All right. So they're questioning his authority. So then these parables and kingdom parables lend themselves to authority as it is the king who's speaking them. So they lend themselves to authority. And he gives the parable of the two sons. There the father being the main uh, character, you could say, in the parable because he's the authoritative one. And then the parable of the vineyard, this householder that owns land, is representative of the, representative of the authoritative one. All right, then uh, the... <coughs> At the end of chapter 21, and when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. Okay, they, of course, would represent those who questioned the authority, whether it be of the father or of the householder. Okay, so this would have been the son, and it would have been the uh, hirelings, you could say, or the people that worked in the uh, field of the householder. These would be the ones that the Pharisees represent. So they perceived that he was speaking to them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Okay, why were they going to lay hands on him? Because he, because they um, were trying to do away, they didn't consider him to be authoritative. He didn't a- really answer their question as to where he got the authority from and to whom he got it from. The truth of the answer is, it is inherent in his person. So then they were going to lay hands on him, but they feared the multitude. All right, because they took him for a prophet. All right, so then we picked up in chapter 22. That's the context. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, okay, so these two parables, they perceived that he was talking about them. He gives them another one, all right? So it's really the same kind of context. It's an issue of authority, all right? It's an issue of them accepting his person. In all of this is this idea, when we're talking about the kingdom of heaven, that the citizens of the kingdom of heaven accept the person of the king, that is, by virtue of salvation. So you don't receive the the blessings of the kingdom of heaven, as it were, even though it's given to the Jews, unless they accept the person of Christ. We've established that, and I think Christ is establishing that here in the gospel. So um, this is an important issue. Anyway, he goes on then and and gives the parable. Uh, Let's look at verse 1 then. And, and then. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, Okay, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Okay, let's stop right there before I read the rest of it and let's talk about this a little bit historically. Really, historically, it's pretty simple. So 
So we have the parable of the marriage of the king's son. Brings out some pretty interesting aspects of the, of the kingdom of heaven here. Uh, and we have to remember that he's talking to the Pharisees. So we, we understand that by context. All right, so then number one, we looked at the contextual setting. Okay? And that contextual setting regards it is uh, similar to the other two parables. And this is really the question of, question of authority and the question of accepting the person of Christ. All right, now we're going to look at it historically. Okay, this is pretty simple. The Lord is talking about an invitation to a wedding, but it's not just any wedding. It's the wedding of a king's son. Now, this would be a special invitation. Um, what I think of when I think about, in the modern-day example of the wedding of a king's son, and none of you were born yet, but when uh, Lady Diana and Prince Charles were married, that was a huge, huge thing. And they were married way before any of you were born. But I'm just saying I remember it. And I remember what a huge pageant was. It was in uh, Westminster Abbey there in London. And that's where they had in the vaulted ceilings. And it was huge, all this pageantry and everything. And uh, it was a huge thing. You've probably maybe seen, um, I don't know, clips of it or whatever. But that was a huge thing. So to have been invited there, so then the House of Lords was there. And as the House of Commons, I think that's how they do. So they were all there, lined up there. And they were all in their regalia and all of that. And it was very, very um, kingly, okay, I guess you could say. And, of course, uh, Queen Elizabeth was there, who never seems to ever go away. <laughs> She's a permanent fixture. But anyway, um, so anyway, she was there, and uh, it was this huge thing. And, and, I, and when I think of this, I think of what kind of honor would it have been to have received an invitation to that wedding. I mean, the whole world was watching at the time. And to have received an invitation at that wedding would have been a special thing. Not everybody gets invited to that. So if you were to have received a special invitation to that wedding, that would have been something special, I would think. I, don't, I doubt you would forget that. All right, so what, what we're saying then is historically, when a king's son gets married, all right, that's, an, that's, a, that's a huge event. That's big, okay? Maybe these... Uh, Pharisees or other people, certainly they knew about this. They're underneath Rome. And Rome, the marriage of uh, the Roman Caesars and all of that was, if you know anything about the history of Rome, it's a very topsy-turvy history. It changed hands many times. There was wars. There was intrigue. There was dissension among families. And uh, this person killing this one and then remarrying this one. And then the marriage of um, the, the, the Caesar's daughter to this person and all of that. These are how arrangements were made back then. And so I would think that the Jews would have been familiar with weddings in high, high uh, esteem or protocol, okay? So um, historically speaking, we really just have to look at what a, um, a kingly wedding and a royal wedding, if you will, was really like and how really important it is. And so in looking at that historically, we can see that the Lord here in this parable puts um, a very high premium on, uh, on this particular wedding. So he's going r right to the top of this one, how very important it is. So that's really, we can look at that historically. That's pretty simple. All right, now, based on the contextual setting and based on just looking at things we say historically or around that sort of thing, let's read the parable. And I want you to begin to think about what the main idea that the Lord is trying to get at here. Okay, and I'll ask you. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But, but they made light of it. And went their way. They made light of a kingly invitation to a wedding. And went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. So it's not just that they refused to go and they treated it lightly. They also very lowly esteemed the servants of the king. 
But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, <clears throat> and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. So there's judgment. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways. Now what would have made them worthy? Simply accepting the invitation. They didn't have to do anything. All they had to do was accept the invitation. Everything was done for them. We see salvation here, don't we? Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. And so those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. Then he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, <coughs> For many are called, but few are chosen. All right, a little bit more of, a histor of the historical setting because before we come up with the main idea. This idea of a garment. The, a king, when he invited the guests, he would have garments for them. He would have something for them to put on, okay? Whether it be something they would put on over or whatever. There was something for them to put on. And this would be, th this would probably show lots of different things. It would show the king's favor. It would show the king's favor towards that person. They would be able to keep the garment, and it would be a memento to, to the fact they were at the king's wedding. Or, a, and, and it could also distinguish those who are uh, at, at the wedding at being invited, or those that were at the wedding just because they showed up. Okay, and the garment is what distinguished it. See that? So that's kind of another uh, look at it historically. All right, so if we look at the, the here, they're questioning his authority. He's giving them a parable. He's speaking to the Pharisees in particular. We saw that contextual. We see how, um, how important it is for, a, for people to accept this invitation to a wedding. All right, so knowing those things, having read through the parable, before we begin to interpret it, what do you think the main idea is concisely? What would it be? What's he getting at? I'm not asking you to be just, just a concise thing. Well, the, the people who were called at first could be like the, tra the people of Israel, and then, you know, the, the servants could be the prophets. And the prophets so you're, prophets. you're interpreting it. Just give me the main idea. What's the main thrust? I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you, but let's get to the... You have to accept the king's invitation to be worthy. Okay, right, right, exactly. That's it. In order to be worthy... You have to accept the invitation. That's it. That's what he's saying. The, the other things that we would, uh, we would bring into it really revolve around that. So that's the main idea. Simple. All right, now let's go into in interpreting it then. All right, so... Um, having read this then, let's, let's look a little bit of, uh, of, of the, the difference between this one and the wicked husbandman. Let's kind of relate both of these a little bit so we can see some couple different aspects because the, the idea of a householder, um, <coughs> you're lending out his, uh, his lands to husbandmen, what we talked about before, is similar to a king lending out or invitations to his guests. So we have a similarity here. But sometimes it's good to look at them in contrast because you can see some, of, some different sh shades of difference between uh, one and the other and uh, what the Lord was getting at here. So this is, is a little bit better, a little bit more of an in-depth study into it. So the wicked husbandmen, all right, you have uh, people refusing to fulfill their responsibility. The householder gave them privileges. Remember, he prepared all of the, he, he built the tower, he put the wall there. They didn't have to do anything. Just like the people that were invited to the wedding didn't have to, to do anything. Everything was furnished for them, right? But what is the difference there? I think that it's difference in, in, in the viewpoint. These people were able to labor in the vineyard and they did not fulfill their responsibility. They had a responsibility. They, already, they had really accepted the invitation, you could say. 
so to speak, because they were in the, the, in the vineyard there, but they did not fulfill their responsibility. Here, with the, with the king's wedding, there was a refusal even to accept the invitation. So there's a little bit of a difference there, a shade of a difference, and I think uh, it deals with being worthy. The, these people that were given this invitation were not even considered worthy at all, and by means of, um, of, that, of that, simply by that invitation, right? And, and them not accepting it. Had they accepted the invitation, they would have been worthy. It's not hard, is it? It's easy. Just accept the invitation, you're worthy. You don't have to do anything. The people did accept the invitation to work in the vineyard, but they did not fulfill their responsibility. All right, so there's something there. Um, the son of the householder and the king's son. Is there uh, respect to be given to both of these? Yeah. Why, why should respect and honor be given to the son of the householder? Because he is heir to, to, that, to that land. He's heir to all of those things. And so by course, it should have been respected, and certainly even more so with the king's son. Okay? Uh, because the king, of course, has authority by virtue, vested in his position as king over everything. And so his son then would be the heir to that. And so by course, there is respect there. Um, then... What about, and then let's look at it a little bit in, in, uh, w with respect to what happens to the vineyard. This is interesting. What, does, what did the Pharisees say, if you remember, that the, they themselves said should happen to the vineyard? What did they say? Do you remember? Um, they said that the steward, uh, the husband, should be destroyed. And then, right, and, then and go on. I think you're mixing that up a little bit. You're almost there. Almost there, Trevor. Almost. What, what did they say? It's right here, I think, right? You would let them out to others. Let them out to others, right? So the, the vineyard was to be let out to others. All right, and so, and so they would fulfill the responsibility. So the Lord was looking for other people then to, um, to take over where these did not. They were the original ones. They were, they were given that responsibility, but because they did not fulfill their responsibility and yet even further killed and destroyed those servants, then this vineyard was let out to others. Okay, so in a similar way, uh, the invitation to the king, that was refused. They were not worthy then by virtue of their not accepting that invitation. And then what, what, what then happens? Well, and, and so then it was opened up to other guests. You see that? So there's a similar, this is very, very similar. An aspect. I think what we can say then is that what is included in here, now let's look at it eschatologically, okay, fancy word. What, what is opened up here? What, what is the Lord bringing into play here? Into the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven are promises to Israel, and they, they, have, they dealt with physical things. We talked about that. They, they deal with uh, land promise and seed promise. But uh, who are included in that now by virtue of the fact that the, um, the, these people refuse to do their responsibility, they refuse to accept the invitation, he opens the invitation to others. What is brought into play here? It's referring to the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, in other words, Gentiles. Or okay, and in particular, to whom is, is the invitation given? To whom is the, the, the word of the king given? Church. To the church. So the church is, is opened up. It's opened up here. And do you see how, what, when I originally said that it is through the disbelief of the nation of Israel that the invitation was given to and, and, and that his coming was postponed, we said that? It is so that he can accept and he, he can give the invitation to other people. We see that through these parables, don't we? Matthew eleven fourteen says, because you did not believe, the ministry of John the Baptist was not fulfilled. And that was to bring uh, salvation to Israel. And, and to designate who it was. And he did that. He fulfilled that, but Israel refused to believe. So his, his coming again was postponed. And it is so that the Gentiles would accept his invitations. Okay? So this is where the church comes in. It is his organization at that time. So you see that in these parables also is given that same understanding. That through, and why was this invitation opened up to the Gentiles? Because Israel refused it. See that? Why, why is the... Uh, vineyard opened up to other laborers because they refused to fulfill their responsibility. So we see that in all of this, and this is what the Lord is teaching. And we, we only see this in the book of Matthew. It's interesting because it's written to the, to the Jews. So um, 
so we go through this, all right? There was three, really, in this interpretation, we're going to get into this interpretation, and then to finish up this one, we'll talk about the one without the wedding, wedding garment. That's going to be interesting, too. Now, don't forget what I just said, and that's going to come into play later, too. So the interpretation is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's, really three, it's really a three-act drama, if you will, okay? There's really three things. Like you would a theater presentation, you've got act one, right? And then you've got a set change or whatever, act two, here we go. So what was the first act? And this is important. I, I don't say that just to, to say it that way to make it interesting, but really there's three distinct phases. The, the first phase was that the king, and this is by interpretation, we're interpreting this based on this main idea. There's the, a, an invitation was set out, <coughs> sent out, <coughs> and it was a formal invitation. Okay? In other words, they were bid to come. It was a formal invitation. Nowadays, we would receive that in the, pro probably in the mail, right? But there are certain things that you don't receive in the mail that are a little bit more important. They're hand-delivered, aren't they? The, these invitations were probably written down, but they were hand-delivered. So you have, to under, you have to understand, you have to realize that when an invitation to a wedding, there would be, there would be the king's um, workers, the king's servants, would come and officially give you, so if you were bid to come to the wedding, a king's servant would come to your house and present you a formal invitation. It was very, very formal. You see how that works? They don't just send in the mail, okay, and then you throw it out. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It is, is officially presented to you. This is very, 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 um, what is, okay, so if I say, if I'm looking at my list of person, I say, okay, Matthew Smith. Yeah, I want him to come. Just fill out an invitation for him to come. What am I, what am I showing to him? Favor, yeah, exactly. Respect, honor. I'm honoring him, aren't I? I'm honoring. Don't you suppose that the marriage um, of the king of kings, that Israel was the first ones invited, that they had that privilege, that they had that favor? By virtue of what? By virtue of nothing, simply because God chose to do it. And why did I favor him? Because I chose. Did I have to favor him in this example? Of course not. I just chose to do it. I'm going to give him favor. It's the same thing with the nation of Israel. God had his reasons for it. But the point is uh, that this was the first thing. So the first round there, servants were sent on given invitations. At that point then, um, they, they refused it. Okay, so the part of the first act is they refused this formal invitation. Okay, it was just an invitation that was given. It was a formal thing. It was probably written. It was given, and they refused those things. The, the second part of it were the people that went out then and it says in verse 4, And again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come on to the marriage. Now think about what's happening here. And think about how the Lord is talking to the nation of Israel and their refusal to it. It's important for us as, as New Testament Christians in the church to understand that, that the favor that God has shown to us is because of the refusal of Israel. It's important for us to understand, unless we think that we deserve it. So not only did, did I go, and uh, we use the same example, and I gave him a formal invitation. I said, here you go. You're invited to come. And he says, no, nah, no, nah, I don't want that. I come back to him, and I say, look, almost as if I'm pleading with him, saying, and, and giving him reasons to come. I've got a table ready. I've got all kinds of food. Oh, come on, come. You see the idea? Pleading. And now I'm, now I'm sending my servants to plead with him to come. Amazing, isn't it? That is incredible when you think about it. This is not only a king, it's the king of kings is what we're talking about. And Israel was given that formal invitation. Sometimes you may look at the history of the nation of Israel and think, wow, they have really been treated cruelly. What other people have been treated as cruel as a people? But when you understand what they've refused, you follow? Okay. And so the Lord is bringing this out here. Now, that second group went out. And he says, my oxen and fatlings are killed. All things are ready. Come on to the marriage. Verse 5, but they made light of it. So, so what? Big deal. I've got plenty of food. I don't need it. You think about how, how, would it be considered rude? If you invited somebody to your house and they said, nah, thanks. I'm good. <laughs> I don't need it. You know? Now, if they have something to do, that's one thing. But if it's just, eh, I don't really care. It's, it's, you think, okay, well, fine. It's your prerogative. I'm not going to invite you anymore. Right? That's one thing. When we're talking about a king, Sorry, when we're talking about the king of kings, it's a little bit different of matter. You don't refuse that, okay? This is a kind of favor. Things aren't done that way. It is extremely rude. No, that's not a good enough word. I don't know. I don't have the words for it. 
Well, we see that here. He's bringing this out. And, and the Lord is making it this way because he's bringing it out to them. And the remnant took his servants, verse 6. And it goes, it goes further than that. We're going deeper into it. It's not just, no thanks, I'm good. It goes beyond that. Verse 6. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. So this is, deals with judgment against the nation of Israel. And of course, that judgment will climax at the great in, in the Great Tribulation. But, so that invitation is, by the way, is the invitation is still extended out to Israel. It is, but it's done through the church now. So, um, this, this, so it's more than that. How much, how much uh, more of a reason would the Lord have to punish his own people if, number one, I gave him a formal invitation and refused. Number two, I came with other servants and said, look, I've got food, I've got all this stuff, come on and come. And he said, not only does he make light of it, he, take, he comes to me and he treats me spitefully and slays me, slays the king's servants. Now you look at it that way and you think, well, this is really what's happening. All right. By them, by virtue not accepting now, let's put it back into this time. The, the very invitation he's talking about is that man that's giving them this parable. That's an incredible thought. To, to a Jewish person, to a Pharisee at this time, who is burning in hell right now, do you suppose that this parable is ringing in their ears every day of their life? Do you think of it that way? All right, so... Uh, the remnant took the servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And good reason to be, okay? It's not like he, he wasn't long-suffering. It's not like he wasn't very patient with them. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Why were they not worthy? Well, I think he's given ample evidence of why they weren't worthy there. So now, now here's, the, here's the blessing to us. Go ye therefore into the highways, and, ha and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. So these guests did come. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. We'll get to that in a minute. So the third act in this drama is the king going out and bidding um, anybody, really, to come in at all. It wasn't this specific initial invitation, nor the pleading with them. Now he opens it up to everybody. So you see what the Lord is saying here. And by the way, he's, he has established his church in Matthew chapter 16. So this is the institution that the Lord is using here, and he's bringing it to light. All right, so... Um, so they gathered it, all these people together. <coughs> um, it doesn't say that everybody accepts the invitation. So really, it's the same idea um, now, even in the, in the church setting, that we, when we go out and give the gospel presentation, do people refuse the gospel? Do a majority of the people refuse the gospel? They do refuse it. Okay? Are, are, is, is, is the refusal... Of the, and, and by the way, let's go beyond that. Would they treat spitefully the servants that send the gospel? Well, in this country, we have that freedom still, but in other countries, they do. And if that freedom is removed, and it seems like we're heading that way, it's going to be the same way. But it's no different. So this three-act drama is repeated over and over and over again. In other situations, in other times, in other, it's the same idea. All right. So we've interpreted it, and now it's based on the uh, main idea in the contextual and historical setting. The Lord here is getting these, these Jews to understand that what, what they're really, what it's really, he's getting the viewpoint. And it's good to look at God's viewpoint. All right. Um, now, verse 11. Now, let's find, figure out who this is. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, we talked about the wedding garment. And he saith unto him, friend, he calls him friend. That's interesting. How camest thou in thither, uh, hither, not having a wedding garment? And, and he was speechless. And then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him out of darkness. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So apparently this man was called, but not chosen. Okay. Um, what, what is the idea here? 
Well, let's look at the points about this man, okay? So let's look at the, um, what shall we say? The without wedding garment man. <laughs> I just made up an adjective. The without, the without wedding garment man. Okay, let's look at, um, I've got five points that's going to help us to interpret who this person is and what the Lord is getting at here. All right, number one, the king himself noticed him. The king's servants did not. It was the king himself who noticed him. So he went out, when the king went out and saw the guests, he saw a man which had not a wedding garment. These weren't the servants, this was the, the, the king himself. Okay, I think that's, that's an important point. Number two, of course, he didn't have a wedding garment. So apparently, this person was not given a, a uh, or, or, or he refused the formal invitation, or perhaps he was given a formal invitation, but he refused it. At any rate, there came a time when this man did not accept the invitation. All right? So he didn't have a garment on. Number three, the king called him friend by virtue of the fact that the king gave him an invitation the king was favoring him calling him a friend obviously the this man that did not have a wedding garment knew about the wedding he knew it was there he knew it was there but he didn't have that garment so one time he refused it so he knew details regarding the wedding, but he refused the honor of accepting the invitation. You follow that? Number four. The king asked why he didn't accept the invitation. So he asked him. Giving him, uh, giving him the opportunity to defend himself. Verse 12. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? What does it say? He was speechless. What could he say? Well, what's he going to say? Oh, actually, this is a wedding garment. Um, I know it doesn't look like any of the other wedding garments you gave, but this is actually a wedding garment. You just you don't know that. What's he going to say, right? It's pretty obvious. Wedding garment, wedding garment, wedding garment, wedding garment. Okay, not wedding garment. <laughs> There's, let's say the wedding garment was white. White, 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 not white. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? He doesn't have it on. You can't hide that. Certainly can't hide it from the discerning eyes of the king. So he was speechless. Um, now, so it is, uh, here's the point. I'll go back to that. Lastly, uh, regarding this man, the judgment was final and it was permanent. This judgment that this man w was deemed worthy of by the eyes of the king was a permanent and final judgment. Verse 13, Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's permanent, isn't it? It's done. For many are called, but few are chosen. It, the, I go back to the original thing as the king that saw this. Apparently, and I'm going to ask you what you think here in just a minute. Apparently, this man had or did not have something that the king discerned that everybody else did not. The other servants could discern something physical and tangible. Apparently the king saw something in this man that everybody else did not see. It was something that the king could discern and everybody else could not. You, see, you follow that? The king who is also um, the, the judge and the, ju the just and the justifier, so the king can pronounce judgment. A king can pronounce any judgment he wants to, can he? Off with your head and that's it, you're done. There's nothing you can do. He is absolute and total and complete authority. Absolute. It's a monarchy. So, um, he discerned something in this person. Nobody else did. He had powers of discernment that others did not have. What is it that he saw in this person that did not allow him to have a wedding garment and, the, and that, that, that made him worthy of judgment? What was it? Something intangible. Something not physical. What is it? 
Okay. Rebellion? He would subconsciously more like. Okay, yeah, good. It's good thoughts. I'm thinking of something that goes along those lines. What, what, okay. What makes somebody, how, how does somebody accept the invitation? By, by what? Okay, and you take it by f- f- faith. Faith. Yes, yeah, very good. How'd you get that one? Yeah, it's faith. Apparently, this man, um, although he showed up, he knew information regarding it. He did not have, have there was there was that faith that he lacked. So he shows up there. He he. So in other words, he knew information regarding the wedding, but he 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 lacked faith. Okay. This is many called, the few are chosen. What is that thing that the king discerns that makes them chosen as opposed to called? Well, I think we can say, and what you're saying goes along the lines, I'm not saying that, but I think it's faith. Hebrews 11, one, yes? So when you say he was uh, reluctant? Who was reluctant? The, the man about the garment. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, he knew of the invitation, but he was reluctant to accept it by faith. Yeah, that's what we're saying. So he knew there was a wedding. Okay, does this, does this prefigure the Jews? Did the Jews have all the inf- information about the wedding and all that? They have all that stuff. They did. What's their problem? It was not mixed with faith and those that heard it. Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Um, and, and then it says in verse 33 of Hebrews 11, Who through faith? Did these things. Okay, and so rebellion, yes, okay, all that is true, but it all has to do with faith, doesn't it? You simply didn't, didn't, uh, didn't believe, wouldn't accept it. Wouldn't believe. And so what does it say about these Pharisees in the parable before? What did they fear when they said they wanted to take the Lord? They, they perceived that he was talking about them. They wanted to take him. Why didn't they take him? Who did they fear? They feared the people because they accepted him as a prophet. Remember it said that? So they're fearing man above God. What is that? It's a lack of? It's a lack of faith. That's what it is. So I think we see that here with the marriage of the king's son. Okay, any final thoughts there? Before I go on to the next one? Would you like to astound us with your theological insights? Okay, the unjust steward. Let's do this one. I'll go pretty quickly through this one. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 16. So we're finally leaving Matthew. Luke chapter 16, the unjust sewer, right in the beginning of the chapter. <clears throat> All right, let's look, about, let's look at the contextual setting, and we'll do the same thing. Why did the Lord teach this parable? What was going on there? All right. <clears throat> what was the Lord talking about here? Well, let's go back to the... Now, we have this par- the parable... Uh, not the parable, the, I guess so. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, which we'll go through later. So those are spoken of here. But before that time, the Lord is teaching his disciples. So this is a teaching <clears throat> uh, for the disciples. All right, so... In verse chapter 14 of, of, of Luke here, and verses 25 and 26, let's set this up. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father, and his mother, and his wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. It's absolute there, isn't it? He cannot. Can't have it both ways, in other words. And then it says in chapter 16, and verse 1, he said also unto his disciples. Okay, so here in 25 and 26, he's giving the teaching, isn't he? He's teaching his disciples, and he's saying that unless you forsake all of these things and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So he's teaching him these things. In chapter 15, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. All right, so this idea of being a disciple and forsaking all these things for, for, and following him, um, 
and hating these things, as it were, and following him, he cannot be a disciple of Christ. So then the Pharisees saw that the Lord was accepting and receiving sinners and eating with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured against him in chapter 15. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, so he's talking about lost things. All right? So he's dealing with the fact that these sinners are lost and they need to be found. Okay, reaching out to them. And then he said also to his disciples. All right, so this is really the contextual setting, is that the Lord is talking about um, to, to his disciples. He's talking about to his followers. All right? A disciple is a steward. Right? A steward, then, is, is somebody that's responsible for the goods of somebody else. We know that. So these, these um, we are stewards of everything. Um, and so the stewardship, then, even of the lost, we are responsible for them. The lost in this world, the lost people in this world, are our, is part of our stewardship. Those who are in the church, we are responsible for it. And the Lord expects us to fulfill that responsibility. The Pharisees then exemplified an attitude of repulsion against the sinners and did not accept them into their fold. The Lord here was opening up their understanding to accept these things and how, in fact, not only to accept, I say accept them, to teach them, but it goes beyond that and it is to, um, uh, that you're a steward of those things. All right, so stewardship goes beyond that even. Okay, so we see then the contextual setting. This is what he's talking about. So understanding that is pretty important to understanding this, this parable and, and interpreting it. All right, so that's the contextual setting. Historically, okay, so we, what about a steward? I think if we just look at stewardship. In uh, verse 1 of chapter 16, and he said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. And the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. So this steward was uh, given the responsibility to take care of the things of a rich man, and he did not fulfill that responsibility. Uh, and so he wasted his goods, this idea of wasting it. Um, and by the way, this is the word prodigal has, to, has the idea of wasting. So he, he wasted his goods. He wasn't a very good steward, and he, so he was to give account of his stewardship. All right, so historically, and, and so we see that here. Uh, and he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? All right, now, a steward and a, um, a rich man. What is the relationship there? Uh, well, in the, in the Eastern customs, and the steward was responsible for the goods of a rich man. He gave him that responsibility. If he did not fulfill that responsibility, then according to Eastern custom, that rich man had authority to take um, whatever he wasted from that person. Okay? If it, whatever it means, if it means that their kids are sold into slavery so that he could pay off his debt or his wife or whatever the case may be, by virtue of the fact that that steward took responsibility of the rich man's goods, if that rich man finds that the steward was wasting his goods, he has the right, according to Eastern custom, for, for, by any means necessary to, uh, to take that, that debt back away from him. Okay? That's Eastern custom. There, there is no um, bankruptcy. Okay? <laughs> there is no, none of that. It, doesn't ha it didn't happen in Eastern custom. There's no such thing. So it's a little, bit different, different, a little bit different than the way we think of things. A debt in Eastern custom was very, very important. In fact, if you did not fulfill, if the steward did not fulfill his, his, uh, his responsibility to be indebted to the, um, to, to the rich man in this case, then uh, that is considered, let's see, where was I going with this? That is considered a, an offense to the rich man. They have a saying, uh, it's called losing face. You ever heard that? Okay. This is what it's talking about. So when the steward then is wasted the goods, the rich man in the sight of everybody else loses face according to the steward, and now the, the steward is despised. Okay? It is a much higher level. All right, so this is Eastern custom. It's important for us to look at this historically so that we understand. Okay, now, um, all right, let's go through then uh, this parable. There was a certain rich man, Chad, Sorry, help me out. I've got like three minutes, don't I? Okay. 
So let's just do this. Um, let's go right to the interpretation. Bam, right there. All right, so what happens? Well, these people come to him and the, or sorry, the, king, the, the rich man hears that the steward wasn't, wasn't doing, let me just read it. I hear this of thee, give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Again, according to Easter custom, he had the right to do that. Verse 3, then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg, I am ashamed. So he realizes his shortcomings. I, if he had realized that beforehand and been really appreciative of the, the fact that, he, that this rich man is giving him, work, and then he wouldn't have behaved this way, but he didn't. However, he comes to the point of, um, of repentance here, at least. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. There is no re resolve of the relationship between the rich man and the steward here. It's, it's a done deal. So now the steward has to do something. So he called every one of his lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my lord? And he said, In a hundred measures of uh, oil. And he said, Take thy bill and write down quickly, write fifty. Then he said he to another, How much owest thou? And he said, In a hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score. And, the lord, and then it says in verse 8, And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Now understand what he's saying. He go on to the lost, right? This is what the, the lost coin of the parables. He talks about them. Remember the Pharisees condemned him for receiving sinners. Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fall, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And faithful how? A steward. Again, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit unto your trust the true riches? And there's really the idea. So the Lord here is, is, is teaching by degrees. And it is that degree of teaching that brings out the force of the meaning. And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one. This wise you have not served God and mammon. All right, so... Um, Tell me, what's the main idea? Well, no, I'll tell you, we don't have time. All right, verse 14 there, it says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. Okay, so the Pharisees were covetous. They refused to fulfill their responsibility as stewards. Understand? And so what is the Lord saying here is that you would be better as a steward to, um, that, that when you mess up, to at least um, be, take responsibility of the stewardship here on earth and show that you're willing to, um, to make reparations for it here, whatever it may be, understanding that those things were committed unto you, then, then so the, the king would feel free to have the true riches. So the point is this. Um, did the steward recognize the validity of the... Uh, rich man's uh, condemnation. In other words, the rich man said, you have wasted my goods. Did the steward say, now wait a minute, that's not true. Okay, that wasn't brought out. He accepted it. And he made, and he, he, he showed by virtue of, of what he, he did in regards to, to now going towards those who were, who were essentially the lost, that he's accepting that condemnation. Understand? He's accepting that responsibility. He's accepting his responsibility. You follow that? And I think that he's teaching this by degrees there. So this is, the, this is what I think is what is brought out here. There's a lot more that we could say. Unfortunately, we don't have any time. You're dismissed.